Thank you for coming uh, to listen to my presentation. So uh, let's start. So in this talk, I'd like to, you know, give a brief introduction how we encountered these issues. Uh, so Upand is one of the main maintainers of uh, the cross-plane project. And I will talk about a little bit about cross-plane and you know uh, how we hit these issues. And then I'd like to briefly mention you know the client-side CRD scaling issues that we have hit. Uh, and also I'd like to talk about the server-side issues that we have identified and uh, you know how we identified them. Uh, specifically, you know the high resource utilization we have observed with the API server uh, and how we provide the API server, what findings we have. Uh, and also, I'd like to briefly mention, uh, you know, how you can profile the API server. So it's really straightforward. So I'd like to, you know, talk a little bit about it. It helped us a lot in this respect. And also, you know, I'd like to talk about, you know, the Kubernetes scalability dimensions and, uh, you know, about CRD scaling in that respect. And, you know, this will conclude the talk. So, uh, Appan is one of the, you know, core maintainers of the cross-plane project. In the cross-plane project, uh, we are working and, you know, uh, generating sometimes, you know, custom resource definitions, uh, which correspond to actual uh, cloud provider resources. And as you will imagine, uh, via these custom resources, you know, uh, you can manage the infrastructure. So, uh, and as you know, there are, you know, hundreds of uh, different resource types in a cloud provider, and. Uh, Crossplane is a uh, multi-vendor, multi-platform project, so that uh, you know either uh, your resources are uh, in uh, AWS, Azure, or uh, GCP. Uh, you can have a cross-plane provider and manage those providers. This also, you know, uh, means that uh, in a single Kubernetes cluster, you may want to install multiple. Uh, you know, cross-plane providers. So, uh, recently we have introduced uh, TerraJet, a code generation framework, uh, where you can generate, you know, cross-plane providers on top of uh, Terraform providers. This also means that in a single provider, like we have generated provider Jet AWS, Jet Azure, and Jet GCP Pro, we have these providers. And uh, on top of these, you know, you can have hundreds of custom resources. And this is where uh, we first observed our issues because, you know, in a single, for example, provider jet AWS, cross-plane provider, we have over 700 custom resource definitions. And in the other G Azure and GCP providers, we have again hundreds of custom resource definitions. And if you would like to uh, install one of them or you know multiple of them in a single uh, you know Kubernetes cluster, this means that uh, you will have thousands of CRDs installed in a single Kubernetes cluster. And you know this is how we you know entered this domain. Uh, this is where we started experiencing issues. So when you sum up, you know, we have about 2,000 custom resource definitions. So uh, we can categorize the issues in two broad groups. First, we have the client side issues that we will talk about. And, uh, you know, we also have the server side issues. The first issue that we had observed was, you know, very high CPU utilization. Uh, that also led us to profiling the API server, trying to understand what's going on, on there. Uh, the upstream cross-plane community was already aware of, you know, high memory utilization. 
uh, and I will talk about them later in, in the slides. So uh, I will also briefly mention you know, our experience with the managed Kubernetes services. Uh, and let's start with the uh, client-side throttling issues that we have run. So I think most of you, uh, if you try to install you know, hundreds of custom resource definitions, might have seen these error messages. So when you run a kubectl command you know, on a cold cache, so I will explain what I mean with a cold cache uh, later. Uh, so please bear with me. Uh, sometimes you can observe you know, some warning messages uh, which says basically that, which says that you know, the request was throttled, right? So you will see that the throttling was caused by client side. Uh, you know, it's not related to API servers, uh, priority and fairness, uh, you know, flow control mechanisms, but it's on the client side. So, if you run the same command, you know, in a same period, in a, you know, a small period of time, uh, then you will not be observing this most probably. It depends on the kubectl command that you run, uh, but for example, the kubectl get notes command uh, run the shoft shortly after the initial command uh, will just return the notes. So to explain this, we will need to you know talk a little bit about the discovery client. So the discovery client is responsible for, as you would imagine, the available APIs in the API server, right? So it discovers the API group list first. So which group versions are available at the API server? Uh, this also includes the, of course, as you would imagine, uh, the resources that are part of the API server itself that are shipped with the uh, core cross-plane distribution, but also the custom resource definitions. Uh, and for each discovered group version, uh, you know, the discovery client has to discover the resource list, the actual kinds under that group version. So we have this discovery client running, for example, as part of kubectl or any other API server client it could be. And we have on the right the API server. So the first request is, uh, you know, done to the slash API endpoint. And uh, you know we get a v1.api group list response from that, you know listing the group versions available at that endpoint. And also, uh, this was a legacy endpoint, so we also need to hit the slash APIs endpoint. Uh, and similarly, we will get an API group list from that endpoint, uh, giving us the available group versions there. And then the discovery client needs to discover uh, the kinds available at these group versions, right? So this is done in parallel. Uh, and from the discovery client, you see you know, some parallel requests uh, for each group version that needs to be discovered. So here, as you see, uh, you know, these represent multiple parallel requests. And the first one, for example, discovers the, you know, batch v1, beta1, and the second one, fsv1, for example, the group version. And the API server is, of course, expected to return the API resource list documents uh, available at those endpoints. So, uh, what has been implemented is um, you know, the client discovery client itself is throttled uh, without any feedback uh, from the API server itself. So this is done uh, via a discovery client, you know, via a token bucket rate limiter implementation currently. And I'd like to briefly mention, you know, how this is implemented uh, to give some technical details. Uh, so let's assume that we have a number of requests to do to the API server, but we have the uh, token bucket rate limiter 
you know, as a throttler. Uh, so you can imagine this, you know, as a kind of bucket, uh, initially filled with, uh, you know, some capacity, uh, and this unit of capacity is represented by the tokens here. And initially, our tiny uh, bucket here has, you know, an initial capacity of three uh, requests or tokens, let's say. And, you know, there's another parameter uh, which we call as the fill rate. Uh, so as requests are admitted, each request will take a token from this bucket, as we will see. Uh, and this, you know, bucket has to be filled, uh, refilled, right? So the R parameter, the rate parameter, denotes, you know, the rate at which this bucket is filled. So let's assume that we have these uh, requests, each represented with a cube, uh, but the time dimension is the Y dimension, unconventional, meaning that, you know, uh, these requests are in parallel. And initially we have three tokens in the bucket. This means that uh, we will, the three of these requests will be admitted, meaning that will be sent to the API server, but uh, the remaining one request, because there is no token left in the bucket, uh, will not be admitted. And, you know, uh, it will be exponentially backed off to be retried again. So as time passes, uh, you know, with the fill rate, the bucket is filled. We now, we now have a token available in the bucket. And when the uh, timer for the, uh, you know, blocked request arrives, uh, it will be admitted this time. And, you know, the error message that you see, or the warning message, I should say, that you see, uh, you know, uh, denotes how long the request was delayed uh, because of this rate limiting. So the client go discovery uh, client uses a token bucket rate limiter uh, with the initial burst parameter of 300 queries or 300 tokens and the rate limit is you know 50.0 queries per, per second uh, so these are the current parameters in kubernetes 1.24 uh, when we were tackling with these issues we realized that you know uh, in kubernetes 1.23 uh, the parameters, the burst rate was 100, excuse me, the burst uh, parameter was 100 queries, and the rate was just, uh, you know, 5.0 uh, query, queries per second. So this was basically due to a bug. You know, these were not the intended parameters. The intended parameters were actually uh, for B300 and for R50.0 uh, QPS. Uh, however, you know, due to a configuration bug, uh, the actual parameters were 100 and, you know, 5.0, which were, uh, you know, quite low when compared to the, you know, number of CRDs that we were trying to install. And, uh, you know, we saw lots of throttling because of this. So, I'd like to also briefly mention about, you know, the cache discovery client. Uh, if you remember when I was showing, uh, you know, an example of the client-side throttling warning messages, uh, I mentioned about, you know, if you run this on a cold cache and we will see what that cache means here. So kubectl uses a disk.cache discovery client, uh, which actually, as you would imagine, you know, uh, maintains a cache of the API resource list and, uh, you know, the responses from the API server, the discovery client gets uh, from the API server. So this cache is maintained under uh, user's home directory by default. 
uh, and it's specific to the API server's uh, host and port. It's specific to the API server. Uh, and as you can see, if you are running an API server on the local host, uh, you can see the IP address as the host name. Or, uh, you know, if, the, if your kube config uh, declares an API server with a host name, then it will be under uh, that host name underscore the port number. And you can see a directory structure of this cache. Uh, so at the root level, uh, under this cache directory, there will be the server groups.json file, which basically you know, holds the group versions available at the API server. And uh, you know, for each uh, API group, you will see specific uh, versions available under that API group. And under each group version folder, uh, you will see the server resources.json file, which actually uh, contain the available uh, resources under that group version. So uh, running the kubectl examples that, I sh that I've shown on a cold cache means you know, running those comments on an empty cache. Like in that example, I had just you know run an RM command to you know clean the cache, uh, so that the discovery client, the cache discovery client, excuse me, uh, would not return you know uh, responses from its cache. Uh, but this cache also, as you would imagine, has a time to live parameter. Uh, up to Kubernetes 1.23, it was uh, just 10 minutes. Uh, meaning that you know every 10 minutes, uh, even if you know the cache has already been populated, the discovery client uh, would need to uh, you know talk with the API server to fetch uh, the latest versions of these documents. However, with Kubernetes 1.24, it has been increased to six hours. So the time to leave parameter for the, you know, the default time to leave parameter for cache discovery client has been increased to six hours. Um, so if you summarize, you know, uh, the throttling issues, the discovery client needs to make at least, you know, two plus the group version count number of requests to discover the available APIs, right? So the initial two comes from the slash API and slash APIs endpoints. Uh, and then uh, for each group version, we will be requesting the available resources under that group version. So those sum up to two plus uh, the group version count. And also please remember that uh, you will also, uh, for example, if you are running a kubectl get nodes command, it will also be a separate request that comes after the discovery phase. So if we install, for example, all three uh, cross-plane, JET-based cross-plane providers, it means that uh, we will have 300, 370 group versions hitting the API server, right? So what are the consequences? If we have, uh, as you see here, the important parameter is not the you know, CRD count, but rather the you know, group version count, right? And um, this table shows, for example, uh, some, diff some you know, running you know, discovery client with some different parameters. Uh, with kubectl, you cannot do this, uh, but you know, we have a custom version of kubectl uh, through which you can explore these parameters. And as you would expect, uh, since uh, we are talking about 370 group versions, uh, and since the burst rate is by default, or excuse me, since the burst parameter is by default, you know, 300 uh, tokens, just 300 queries, uh, kubectl will be throttled if it's running on a cold cache, right? Uh, but if you increase uh, up to the initial burst parameter up to 400, uh, then it's, not, it's no longer throttled. So 
Uh, with this tool, if you pass the rate parameter as minus one, uh, the client side rate rotuler uh, is completely disabled. Uh, but we can see no improvement, you know, after 400 because it's already larger than, uh, you know, 370. So maybe we should also discuss, you know, the API server. Uh, CPU and memory, high API server, CPU and memory utilization issues that we have encountered. So uh, initially, we were installing, you know, 600 and, you know, about 700 custom resource definitions uh, on a single cluster. And uh, I think it's not readable, but uh, as you see here, uh, the API server was immediately started, you know, spanning two cores. Uh, these are, you know, collected from Prometheus metrics, as you, as you would imagine. And, you know, we investigated the, also maybe I should talk about, you know, uh, we also saw high memory utilization, although we did not, we did not, uh, you know, profile, uh, do a memory heap profiling ourselves. Uh, we initially concentrated on uh, the CPU utilization. Uh, and, you know, I will first represent the results uh, from our, you know, CPU heat profiling. So the observation, the immediate ob ob observation uh, from CPU profiling was that, you know, uh, over 40% of our CPU time uh, was spent uh, you know, during Open API V2 spec, uh, aggregated Open API V2 spec serialization. So I will briefly mention what this means. Uh, and you know, when you examine the uh, available uh, profiling data, uh, we spend API server spends lots of time in JSON and marshaling and marshaling operations, uh, and also you know, proto uh, binary serialization. Uh, and also another interesting point was, you know, uh, because, you know, during this uh, aggregation operation, uh, lots of objects are being created and destroyed. Uh, so we had a very high uh, heap churn. Uh, so the garbage collector also uh, accounted for uh, a large percentage of the sampled uh, CPU time. So. Let me talk about, you know, what this Open API V2 spec marshalling means. Uh, with the V1 version of API extensions, uh, each CRD must specify, you know, a validation schema, uh, you know, expressed uh, as an Open API V3 structural schema. Uh, and using this schema, uh, you know, the, a custom resource belonging to the custom resource definition is validated, as you would imagine, uh, during you know, creation and updates. And uh, unknown fields can be pruned by the API server uh, that are not you know, available in the schema. And also, the schema is used for uh, client-side validation. So when you run a kubectl command without specifying, for example, dash dash validate equals false, uh, kubectl validates the CR manifest, and you know if it doesn't conform to the manifest, uh, you know it will reject uh, to work, right? So API servers uh, API server serves an aggregated Open API V2 spec uh, at the slash Open API slash V2 endpoint. And uh, this spec contains uh, or documents, you know, the complete uh, API available at the API server. So uh, by default, this is served as a, you know, serialized as JSON. Uh, so when you hit this endpoint without, you know, specifying uh, with an accept header, a different serialization format like protobuf, you will, the API server will return a JSON. Uh, but, you know, uh, especially for intercluster communication, you know, a, a 
protobuf serialization has also been implemented uh, in the API server. So uh, here you see an example. Uh, aggregated spec example. Uh, and you know, under pets, you will see, for example, uh, the you know open API schema uh, of a custom resource definition. So this also means that uh, when you register a you know custom resource definition, the API server has to recompute the aggregated spec, right? So that custom resource definition itself becomes part of uh, what's available as an API uh, in the API server. And the you know, aggregated open API v2 spec served at the slash open API slash v2 endpoint uh, has to be updated uh, with the new CRD. And if you are registering you know, a bunch of CRDs, this also means that uh, the API server will, in the background, uh, you know, update the aggregated open API v2 spec. So the profiling data uh, had shown that, you know, this is where uh, time was spent. So this was the root cause of the uh, high CPU utilization that we had observed. Uh, and, you know, uh, we got in touch with the upstream crossplay, uh, upstream Kubernetes community. Uh, and luckily learned that they were already aware of, aware of you know, uh, high memory utilization issues, uh, also related to open API v2 spec, uh, you know, processing, and you know, a fix was on its way. So we have also evaluated. Uh, so I will also briefly mention what the fix was. So the fix was. In fact, you know, uh, instead of calculating the aggregated open API v2 spec each time a CRD was generated, uh, the idea was to, uh, you know, defer calculation of the aggregated spec till a request to the open API slash v2 endpoint hits, right? So it basically, you know, defers uh, the calculation of the aggregated spec. Uh, and, you know, if you register a bunch of CRDs, the open API v2 spec is not immediately calculated. Uh, and, you know, whenever a request comes to the slash open API slash v2 endpoint, the API server uh, will for once calculate the aggregated spec. So this uh, saves lots of, you know, CPU cycles. Uh, and, you know, we wanted to see how this affected our profiling data or whether we could quantify the improvements here. And, you know, I think it's not that much readable, but sorry for that. Uh, here you, you will see, you know, the uh, CPU utilization running with this uh, fix. So if you compare it to the previous one, uh, for you know, about 30 minutes, it depends on the number of custom resource definitions uh, you have installed uh, with the provider. But uh, the API server was spending about two cores uh, for a prolonged period of time. And you know, with the laser marshalling of the open API v2 spec, uh, things are in a much better situation for a shorter period of time and with a sh uh, you know, smaller peak, uh, the API server can handle uh, the calculation of the aggregated open API v2 spec. So uh, even with this uh, fix, uh, which is already available in 1.23, uh, so we were, not, we were hoping that these would resolve our issues. Uh, but we could not validate this uh, in the managed Kubernetes offerings. Uh, this was because, you know, we could not run a modified version of Kube API server uh, in these managed offerings. Uh, but after the fix was available, we also revisited, you know, uh, the situation. 
uh, in EKS, AKS, and GK regional clusters. And you know, this table shows our current situation. So in e EKS, by the way, this version does not contain this fix, uh, the laser marshalling fix, but uh, you know, we can install all three providers successfully. Uh, but you will see the client side throttling warning messages, issues, and maybe even failures, uh, you know, because requests may time out due to client side throttling, but whatever the reason, uh, from a cross plane perspective, uh, we could install all three providers. And in AKS clusters, we were good with provider jet AWS and provider jet Azure. Uh, but you know it was not possible to install a third provider uh, and in GK regional clusters uh, we had some problems you know in installing a single provider also so this also means that uh, you know these issues are not resolved uh, and you know one of the purposes of this talk is uh, as the cross-plane community uh, we would like to uh, share our findings and you know uh, uh, drive the upstream community and other uh, you know pro uh, providers uh, solution providers who depend on large number of custom resource definitions uh, you know to work with the upstream community to resolve these issues so um, this is how we provide the API server. So we were using custom, prof, uh, custom builds of Kube API server, as you see, including the fix and not including the fix, and also to test some uh, other ideas. So uh, you know, this profiling data was collected on kind clusters. Uh, we first used kind build node image, uh, you know, running it. Uh, on the specific uh, Kubernetes uh, source repository uh, that contains uh, the Kube API server to be built. And then using this node image, uh, you can create a kind cluster. And then uh, after running kubectl proxy, you can hit the uh, slash debug slash pprof uh, slash profile endpoint to collect profile data. For example, in this example, we are collecting profiling data, CPU profiling data for uh, 30 sec uh, 300 seconds, and then uh, using the uh, you know uh, excellent pprof tool, uh, you can uh, you know examine uh, the profiling data. Uh, so. It requires some experience to interpret the profiling data, but in our case, uh, we were able to accurately pinpoint the open API uh, V2 spec uh, marshalling, uh, you know, uh, as the root cause of ICPU utilization. So, um, Kubernetes has already, you know, a scalable thresholds document. Uh, which is maintained by, I believe, the six scalability uh, community, uh, but it does not consider the number of uh, CRDs per cluster uh, as a scalable to dimension. And you know, the only thing that we could find about you know the number of custom resource definitions, uh, the limit for limiting you know the num uh, the number of custom resource definitions per cluster was in the GA availability document. Uh, I put the references to those documents here, and it suggested 500 as a maximum limit for the scalable target. But as I mentioned, uh, this is not, uh, you know, part of the official uh, scalable to thresholds document. So uh, we also had some chat with the upstream maintainers, and also they also believe that uh, this has to be part. Uh, of the scalability documents, but uh, you know uh, it needs some time, and you know they need to be aware of the use cases and you know use cases similar to ours. So I'm concluding my talk. Thank you very much for uh, listening. Uh, here you can find some uh, further pointers, especially the top two ones uh, from the cross-plane project. 
there are really detailed discussions and you know detailed uh, you know technical analysis etc that you might be interested in if you want to uh, delve deeper into this topic uh, and also uh, the one pager has some uh, you know good tools uh, that you can use to generate custom resource definitions etc uh, for your tests and you know for testing possible solutions thank you very much uh, for listening. If anybody got a question, any questions? Let's take a look. Any questions? Hands? Not all at once. It's been a pretty long day, hasn't it? <laughs> lots and lots of action. Uh, I guess, is there anything else you'd like to add regarding CRDs, your experience with them, your experience before them, what we might expect from them in the future? Yeah, so. I mean, as the cross-playing community, we really, you know, depend on them. Uh, so we would like to drive some effort here uh, with the upstream Kubernetes community uh, to make the Kubernetes control plane more scalable. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, this has to be a community effort and, you know, people from other uh, maybe open source communities or other vendors joining these efforts would be really appreciated. Will you be here for the rest of the week? Uh, yeah. If folks, if folks want to get in touch, pretty easy to find. Let's give another round of applause for Alpen. Excellent talk. Yeah, thank you very much.